Hello Internet, welcome to Game Theory, where today we continue our analysis of FNAF's newly released ghost stories, The Fazbear Frights. Last week we covered the majority of this book's key reveals, including the massive bombshell where we visit what is chronologically the earliest Freddy Fazbear's pizza we've yet seen, a location that we have never visited before in any of this series canon, but one that we know to have existed somewhere in the background since the release of FNAF 2. With six murders set in 1985, it makes it very likely that this was the mystery location to have closed down the franchise before its grand reopening two years later in 1987. And that, loyal theorists, is why I scrounged through every scrap of FNAF content out there. And, like, entered the stitch wraith over here. Scott throws out ideas and I'm just digging through his dumpster hoping to cobble it all together into a workable body. <laughs> As that silly children's workbook taught me years ago, some of the biggest lore reveals in this franchise can happen in the unlikeliest of places. Yeah, we're gonna reveal Golden Freddy's name in this children's workbook word search. Fantastic. Yay! Actually, it was fantastic. I thought it was a brilliant way to do it. That said, I will not forgive Dabbing Chica. Never. Truly a cursed image. But you see, I think there was one other massive lore reveal hidden in Fazbear Frights, buried amongst the tales of Extreme Makeover Robot Edition and Ball Pit Time Machine. A lore reveal that is absolutely worth our time exploring today. A lore reveal that introduces us to a character who's been helping to pull the strings since the very beginning. One who's been misleading us about the horrors of Fazbear Entertainment. Someone whose importance goes far beyond just the 40 pages he appears in throughout this book. I think into the Pit may have just introduced us to the creator of these games. And I'm not talking about Scott Cawthon. Let me explain. One of the strangest inclusions in FNAF VR Help Wanted was a reference to a game designer that was telling lies about the horrors happening at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. We know that Fazbear Entertainment has developed something of a bad reputation over the last few decades. And while it's true that some stories associated with our name were loosely based on actual events, the majority of them were total fabrications from the mind of a complete lunatic. Lawsuits pending. And yes, that sweet, sweet piece of man candy that you see there is Scott Cawthon himself. Okay, fine, ha ha, funny joke there, Scott. I mean, this series likes to get self-aware. We're all familiar with that. And for a mainline title in the series, this one felt pretty extreme, but fine, cool with it. And then you keep playing the game. And what started as a one-off tongue-in-cheek joke actually becomes a critical piece of the lore. They lied to us. They lied to all of us. They told us that the whole point of this VR game was to undo the bad PR done by a rogue indie game developer who supposedly made up a bunch of crazy stories that tarnished the brand. But it doesn't stop there. There's more twists in FNAF VR than there is in a typical M. Night Shyamalan movie. Fazbear Entertainment hired the game developer. Those indie games were designed to conceal and make light of what happened. This isn't just an attempt to rebrand. It's an elaborate cover-up. The whole thing starts with like, oh, this game designer is a joke. Psych! No, he's not. He's actually critical to the lore and is exposing the crimes happening at these restaurants. Booyah! Fooled you again. He's actually one of the villains. When the dust actually settles on this plot development, what we're left with is a game designer looking like Scott Cawthon, hired by Fazbear Entertainment to make indie games, the games that we've all been playing up to this point, in order to misdirect us away from the real lore of the story. So, of course, I did an episode all about how Scott Cawthon is the villain of FNAF. Let me rephrase what we just heard. Scott is one of the bad guys. He was lying to us. If FNAF VR's tapes are to be believed, pretty much everything we know from the first three, at least, but maybe even four, five, heck, six games could all be thrown out as complete fabrications created by Scott Cawthon for the sole reason because he was paid off by Fazbear Entertainment. Except I was wrong. Nothing new to be sure, but here, my timing couldn't have been any worse. You see, earlier that very week that I uploaded that video, Scott made a post on Reddit saying that the indie game developer from FNAF VR isn't him. Here's what he had to say, quote, The question is this, is Scott Cawthon now a part of FNAF lore? The short answer is no. Yes, I used my own picture for this indie developer because it's an obvious parallel, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually me in universe. End quote. Yeah, Scott, you remain vague and 
mysterious about the lore for years. Half a decade at this point. And this, this one little detail is the thing that you want to clarify. And you choose, you, you just choose to do it right before my video on this very topic, which, while it is honestly still a perfectly valid theory, gets everyone to dismiss all of the findings for that entire theory, since it's the one small detail that I get wrong and everyone focuses on. I don't have feelings about any of that at all. Scott continues, quote again. So no, I'm not canon. Only the existence of a game developer that supposedly made video games based on actual events that may or may not be a cover-up by Fazbear Entertainment is canon. Keep in mind that I do tend to use pictures of me and my family in the games, just because they're so readily available. In FNAF 4, I used a picture of a mountain range that I took while I was a truck driver in West Texas. I used a picture of a snowman that me and my older sons made together. I used a picture of a pet mockingbird that we nursed back to health one year. Do these have lore significance? Well, you probably already know the answer. End quote. Oh, I know the answer, Scott. And that answer is yes! You breathe and it becomes canon. My ever-decreasing sanity aside, it does leave open the door as to the identity of who this rogue indie developer is. And I think that Fazbear Frights' story into the pit reveals to us who it might actually be. Admittedly, this is a bit looser of a theory, but I think it's one worth discussing. I believe our secret game designer, the one who's been lying to us through these games, is the story's main character, Oswald. The little 10-year-old boy who winds up in a time-traveling ball pit to visit the 1985 murder scene of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. I believe he grows up to be hired on by Fazbear Entertainment to create these games. Now, that might seem like a stretch for a character that we only get to know in the span of 40 pages, but holy ballora, is there a lot of evidence in those 40 pages to back that assertion up. Shortly into his story, Oswald is shown to be obsessed with animatronics for no apparent reason. Quote from the book, He didn't know why, but lately he'd been drawing mechanical animals, bears, bunnies, and birds. He imagined them being human size and moving with the jerkiness of robots in an old science fiction movie. Sometimes he drew the animals exposed metal skeletons or sketched them with the fur peeled back. It was a creepy effect, like seeing a person's skull peeking out from beneath the skin, end quote. Now mind you, this is without him ever, ever having a connection to animatronics. Heck, he doesn't have a connection to the pizzeria at this point in the story. He has never been there, nothing. This is just him naturally choosing to draw these oddly specific things without any outside references or influences. So already this boy seems to have himself a strange connection to the FNAF lore or is just a psychopath in training, but there's more. For such a short story, into the Pit takes a lot of time to establish Oswald as a fan of video games, B-grade Japanese movies, and manga. A lot of time for a 40-page story. We hear about him listening to video game soundtracks. We witness the debates that he has with his father over cheesy Toho-style Godzilla monsters. How funny he finds the actor's lips not matching up with the dubbed-in words in those sorts of movies. He visits the library and we hear about his enthusiasm for the latest manga installment. Now, the connection to video games is pretty obvious here, right? If he likes video games, well, well, there's a chance that he'd want to grow up to be a designer of video games himself. But it's his connection to old, cheesy Japanese films and manga that really got my gears turning. Think back to Ultimate Custom Night. At various point thresholds in that game, you would unlock the Bear of Vengeance cutscenes, each one clearly inspired by those old, poorly dubbed Japanese samurai movies, the art style clearly riffing on classic anime and manga animations. The mysterious designer of the FNAF games, who presumably made Ultimate Custom Night, would need to be a fan of this style of storytelling to want to incorporate it into his work. And here we have ourselves Oswald, a person who exists in this universe, whose limited characterization is spent establishing him as a fan of exactly this type of storytelling. Speaking of limited characterization, it's a minor connection, but a key point of the story is how money-strapped Ozzy and his family are. The reason he spends so much of his time in the library and the pizzeria is that they're both cheap forms of entertainment during the day. Well, his family works over the summer. If Oswald were to grow up and end up designing the FNAF games, well, it would actually be a somewhat similar story arc to Scott Cawthon himself. As his story goes, Scott was a struggling game designer. He was making minimum wage during the day as a Dollar General store clerk and working on his games at night, with none of them going anywhere, many of them being poorly received. The first Freddy's game was the one where all of his years of hard work and grinding finally paid off. There's obviously a lot more to that story, but suffice it to say, Oswald seems to be a character after Scott's own heart, coming from modest means, a fan of nerd culture, so to see Ozzy be the in-universe 
first programmer of these games to be Scott's literal in-universe stand-in for himself, well, it doesn't seem like that much of a stretch. But okay, saying our designer was this kid who draws spooky animatronics, comes from a low to modest income family, a story similar to Scott, and likes the video games and anime is still a bit of a stretch, right? Describes like 90% of kids. Okay, well, maybe not all kids have a psychic connection with a decades-old murder restaurant, but the rest of it, sure, pretty generic kid. Here's the thing, though, we're not just talking about Oswald's character traits here. If you look at Ozzy's experience with the Fazbear restaurant in the story, you could see where he'd be inspired to include certain game elements that we ourselves have played through. The first and most obvious is Jeff, the current owner of Jeff's Pizzeria, the pizzeria that took over the abandoned Freddy Fazbear's and Oswald's time. He's described in the book like this, quote, Jeff was creepy too. He looked a hundred years old, but was probably just 30. With those heavy-lidded bloodshot eyes, the stained apron, and the slow speech and movement, he was like a zombie pizza chef, end quote. Slow movements, bloodshot eyes, zombie pizza chef with a red stained apron. It sounds like it could very well be the inspiration behind an undead murderer in a pizzeria who refuses to die. Or a walking purple zombie that haunts the streets of the town. Remember, the game designer hired on by Fazbear Entertainment was tasked to lie about and make light of the murders in the Freddy restaurants. So what we see in the games would likely be a mix of reality and fiction. Oswald could very well be pulling from his real life experiences. I mean, the names of people Oswald encounters also have themselves an uncanny similarity to what we see in the games. Ozzy's best friend from the past is named Mike. A Mike who outright says this, quote, You know, when I was little, I loved Freddy Fazbear's band. I even had a stuffed Freddy I used to sleep with, end quote. Wee -woo, wee -woo, wee -woo. Oh, sorry, that's the lore connection alarm. It goes off anytime someone makes a passing reference to FNAF 4. In that same conversation, Mike also reveals that he has himself a sister. Wee -woo, wee -woo, wee -woo. Sorry again. And then they also talk about how creepy clowns and dolls are. Woo -woo. Apologies, that's my other alarm. That's the sister location revelation alarm. Anyway, it doesn't seem to be Mike Afton or Mike Emily. Oh, you can bet I checked into that one. But these conversations could certainly have inspired Oswald to make a character named Mike, who lives and loves the Freddy Fazbear franchise, who has himself a favorite Freddy plush, who has a sister who loves dolls and becomes a really creepy clown doll hybrid who commands an army of dolls herself. Later in the book, Oswald meets a girl named Gabrielle, who loves Greek myth and gives him the courage to fight back against Golden Bonnie. Gabrielle is a very random character, but one with, again, a very important name. One that is, once again, shockingly similar to one of the kids that we find on our gravestone, Gabriel. Even the theme of this short story could have inspired Oswald's games. You see, after Oswald uncovers the 1985 murders, his dad gets sucked into the time travel pit by Golden Bonnie. And not just sucked in, he's replaced. Suddenly, everywhere his dad should be, Ozzy instead sees the silent, staring Golden Bonnie stalking him, watching him. Ozzy is the only one who sees it too. Everyone else just sees his father like normal. Actually a really creepy, disturbing piece of imagery. One that gets Ozzy to question his own sanity. But it's also one that directly ties back to the core motif of the games. A father, William Afton, becoming a golden bunny to terrorize kids, including his own son. A son who then has to go out, seek, and ultimately rescue his father in order to end the nightmare. And then you just have random lines inserted into the story that kind of fit but kind of don't but are also oddly specific to key moments throughout the FNAF franchise like this quote every day you toss me out on the street like garbage end quote which are reminiscent of the FNAF 6 salvage minigames with animatronics literally being thrown out on the street this line as Ozzy says it in the context of the scene is kind of awkward but if you're looking at it through the lens of hey this is actually a lore connection back to the games now all of a sudden it fits perfectly there are just so many details that line up between Oswald's character, the people he meets, and the things that he goes through that line up with someone who could have made the FNAF games, who could have concocted parts and pieces of this story. Even motive-wise, it makes sense. Maybe Fazbear hires him on because they know he knows the truth, and it's to get him to shut up. Maybe Ozzy accepts the money because A, he's poor, and B, he's scared. He knows what they can do to him. I mean, will any of this ever come into play in any way, shape, or form? Unclear? Probably not. 
but one. It actually may be able to help us better separate out the truth from the fiction in the early games of this franchise. Like knowing zombie people were inspired by Jeff, the owner of Jeff's Pizzeria, the zombie guy, may take all of that information off the table and really let us focus in on what truly matters, a specific subset of murders. But even if it doesn't do anything grandiose like that too, I wouldn't be surprised if we end up seeing Oswald again at some point. I mean, already there's a new teaser for the next installment of Fazbear Fright, Fetch, up on Scott's website, so you can bet that we're gonna have a lot more to say about this series and its connections with the games in the coming months. But hey, that's just a theory. A GAME THEORY! Thanks for watching.